the world needs people who can solve complex problems now more than ever. Would not have been able to land the type of job and be, fulfill the type of role that I wanted to without the MBA. So in really simple terms, it enabled me to get the job that I have now. The MBA really gave me the opportunity to think about where I want to go in life. Doing the, the Cranfield MBA brought me right up to being able to walk into a bank like JP Morgan and expecting them to hire me as a VP. With the MBA program, you have better opportunity to influence others. It's been one of the best things that I've done for myself. The main thing that Cranfield MBA really gave me was different perspective on how to look at a business and how to deal with people. I think if pre-MBA me were to meet post-MBA me, she'd be really proud. Welcome to Cranford University. You are in good company. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. My name is Toby Thompson, and I'm talking to you today live from the Granville Turner Studios. I'm joined by Lauren Thackeray. Uh, Lauren Thackeray is on the MBA admissions team, so we'll come back to Lauren very shortly. But please stick around. Coming up in this next one hour 45, thereabouts, it's really dependent upon your good selves, is a bunch of exciting stuff about the MBA. We're assuming you're interested in the MBA at Cranfield, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So coming up in the next one hour 45, we're going to have an introduction to the Cranfield MBA. Pretty much everything you'll need to know, possibly a bit more too. We're going to have a masterclass from two masters, <laughs> two approachable masters, I would say, who teach on the MBA. So you've got some real, a real chance there to find the tone of what a standard Cranfield lecture will be like. And I say standard, it's not a standard lecture, so more on that story later. We're also going to have in the time coming up real students, so not actors. Yes, Cranford is great. Real students to whom you can ask pretty much any question about what it's like to be here at Cranfield. And best of all, like I just mentioned, this is interactive. Please, uh, using text chat only, we're not going to do audio this time, but text chat only. You can ask your questions, your challenges, your observations pretty much at any time during the time that we're together here. Please, if there's something you don't understand, we've said something you don't get, or you have a burning question, please just type it away into the text chat. I'm sure we are the third or fourth or fifth Zoom meeting uh, that you've had today. So with that, I'm going to hand back over to my colleague here, um, Lauren. Lauren, tell us more. You're the on the admissions team at the MBA. I am. So you, so you know everything there is to know about the MBA? Yeah, definitely. Let's go, <laughs> let's go with that. Um, I know a lot of people are going to be here to specifically listen to the masterclass. So I'm going to keep the introduction really short and sweet. Um, I'm going to start with a really short overview, an introduction to Cranfield and our transformative MBA. And then I'm just going to give you five keywords to learn, which I think then we'll, we'll have a chat about. So I'll start by saying that Cranfield is absolutely unique. Um, we are unique in terms of our history, in the makeup for our community and our approach. And all of that leads to a unique learning experience. Now, let me take it back a second and explain what I actually mean by that. So our history, we're the, uh, we are one of the oldest business schools in Europe and we have the longest standing MBA in the UK. We've grown from a college of aeronautics 75 years ago into uh, an institution that specializes in creating leaders in technology and management. <coughs> Today, what this actually means, we are the only dedicated postgraduate university in the UK. And that means our faculty are, are both industry experts and academic experts. 
We have we work in partnership with businesses to help build programs that have real world applications. And then on top of that, because we are postgraduate only, the people in the classroom that you are interacting with are bringing their own valuable business interactions with them. So it means you have that fully uh, valuable business experience. And all of this adds up to an amazing Cranfield community that you take with you in and out, out of your time at Cranfield. Now, why do you need to care about this, about our history and the, the community? All of this means is that you have an amazing learning experience. We, those benefits and community remains with you long after you've left. And the Cranfield experience, because we are postgraduate, doesn't means we are, it's not just academic theory. It means business is embedded at every level, in the classroom and the programme design. And everything we teach is very hands-on and very practical. Now, if I can just have a look at the rankings for a moment. I'm not going to read all of these through because we can all read. Um, and a lot of this information <laughs> is available on our website. What I will do is draw your attention to one or two highlights. Obviously, there's huge heritage in our MBA and in the School of Management itself. We're a top five MBA in the UK, but one of the things that people don't tend to know is that we are sixth in the world for teaching influence. Now, that's a ranking that was compiled in partnership with the Financial Times, and what that actually means is that professors and academics around the world in Harvard and MIT, Oxford, are all using textbooks from Cranfield professors. Um, and it's, it's an amazing insight into the quality of the faculty that we have here. Especially relevant today, we have uh, one of our rankings is that we are third in the UK for the quality of our entrepreneurial education. This is especially relevant because obviously we have Steffi and Martin uh, going to be doing their presentation, their masterclass shortly to us. And it's worth knowing that Steffi for many years was course director for the MBA and it's partly down to, or in fact very much down to Steffi's influence that we have this heritage in our uh, in our MBA for entrepreneurship, and that so many, not only do so many people join us today because of that speciality in entrepreneurship, but we have so many people who've gone on to start their own businesses. And actually, some of the alumni on this call later this afternoon uh, have actually gone on to do just that. So I did promise you some keywords. So without further ado, um, those keywords that if you're going to remember. Only one thing from this little introduction is these five words, it's transformative, immersive, connected, ambitious, and leadership focused. Lauren, thank you. I'm gonna to have to pick you up on that first word there, the transformative, because we've all heard that word. Yes. It carries quite a lot of weight. What do you mean by transformative? Well, transformative, you're absolutely right. It is a word that it often used in marketing fluff. <laughs> and at Cranfield, the reason we use transformative in our marketing is because we hear it again and again and again when we talk with our faculty, when we talk with our alumni, when we talk with the students. And I think it's because there are so many layers to transformation at Cranfield. We have the obvious, which is transforming your career, that accelerating your career or changing the industry. Um, it could be starting a new business. There's also transforming your knowledge, returning again to that fantastic ranking about being sixth in the world for the quality of academics. But there's also the, the network that you get access to, being number one in the world for the breadth and effectiveness of our alumni network. You are transforming your network. You are meeting people in the classroom that are people who are going to be eventual business partners. But there's also the softer side of things. There is the the transforming of the relationships that you hold, meeting people that are going to be future spouses and really? friends for life. Absolutely, we have we have all sorts. I mean, at some point, I'm going to have to start looking at getting like sort of baby grows branded <laughs> up with with Cranfield MBA. But we've also got people who make friends for life. A lot of that is down to the learning groups that people are put in, and as well, I think there's the transforming yourself, the way you see the world. Um, our deputy dean Joan Ellis at one point said. The MBA means you you join the MBA with a certain view of the world um, based on your experience. And by the time you are done with it, you have a 360 view of the world. It is eye-opening. 
And I think because of that, it is transformation. It's more than just building some skills. You are building a network. You are building knowledge foundation. You are building relationships, personal and professional, that are absolutely going to change the way you relate to the world and the way you have an impact in business. A transformative approach to the word transformative, impressive. That <laughs> second word that you got there, immersive. Immersive in what exactly? What do you mean by immersive? Well, immersive, it, again, there's a couple of angles to this. So there's the physical immersion. At Cranfield, we are in the countryside. We are on a campus. You are in a Cranfield bubble where you are dedicated to people just developing yourself and, and exploring. It's a year-long course as well, which means you are, it's intense. Mm -hmm. You are straight in there. We've got small class learning with learning groups, which means you are in an intimate setting as well. And as well, you've got a highly dedicated support team. So we've got lifelong careers. We've got um, careers support. We've got people whose roles are to ensure that you have the quality of experience throughout your, your experience here. And, um, but I think as well, there's also, there's also an emotional element to that, what that immersiveness enables you to do. And actually my manager, um, who's the head of uh, the MBA admissions director, she actually did the Cranfield MBA and came back years later because she loved it so much. <laughs> and one of the things I endorsed <laughs> it is, and she worked in the city um, for in financial services. And I remember her saying um, when she was talking to the new cohort who joined this year that actually this is a really safe space to explore, mm. to explore your personal development. There'll never be a better combination of people to support you, of time you can spend on yourself, the right atmosphere and the right support to really immerse yourself in your own personal development. It's a safe space to practice that transformation. And pretty rare, you don't get much of a chance to uh, do that. It, it would be lovely if we did, but absolutely <laughs> not. A couple more questions then. Uh, you talk about connected. Mm. Uh, I think we know what that means. Are you connecting individuals or is it business or what? Both. 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 Um, so our heritage is obviously tied very much into business relationships. We are close to business. It's what we, what we do. Our faculty, the majority of them still work in business. They're still shaping business, whether they are operating as consultants or operating uh, in policy. Um, they are still very much at the front end and we have as well um, partnerships with leading businesses. They shape the programs to make sure they are as relevant as possible. Um, we also have things like the international business assignments, which we have partnerships with, with business to help people find the right internships. The connections though is also about the the personal connections that you have. So it's student to student, mm -hmm. it's student to alumni, but also student to faculty. I think one of the things that I think is quite unique about Cranfield is that the faculty do tend to treat the MBAs like colleagues. They're very approachable. Even our dean is incredibly approachable. We all had to give him a bit of feedback this Christmas and every single word, we're very approachable. <laughs> but, That's nice, but, a nice touch. But, but he is. And unusual and for business schools, by the sound of it. It is, and actually I think it is unusual because a lot of time people are, because people are looking at the academics only, you don't necessarily get those personal connections. Mm. And Steffi, I know, is, is still hugely involved in helping people who've gone to set up their own businesses. And there really is a depth of connection that you have with the with the experts here, with the alumni and, and with the students as well. Almost family by the sound of it from what you said. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a very big family. I think the total amount of alumni we have is about 17,000. So Whoa. complicated family gatherings at Christmas. And we've got an alumni <laughs> member joining us later on. I got I think just quickly one more question. Mm. I think ambition is one of the words that we love here at mm. Crown, but it's one of our values. Tell you, say more about that in terms of the MBA. Well, you're right. We have four values and Ambition is one of them, and the, the dean often likes to talk. The dean of the School of Management, that is, often likes to talk about how we have a real ambition for excellence and quality, and that means we. Um, it's about our mission to develop future leaders of business. We are a Financial ten, Times top ten business school in the UK, and everything we've mentioned so far about the quality of education, the quality of connections, the way we work with business is, is why we are one of the triple accredited schools. Um, and that is a teeny tiny proportion of business schools worldwide are triple accredited. And it's the accolades that they are all aiming for. And 
that's a reflection of our ambition and the reason we bring in ambitious students and candidates ourselves because we want to develop those future leaders. Wow, you heard it here first. If this sounds of interest to you, <laughs> please, we're very keen for you to join our MBA program. To that end, uh, we want you to test the taste, the flavor, there's a, a cooking thing going on here, uh, of a lecture, a fairly regular lecture that you'd get on the MBA. And to that end, hopefully I'm joined uh, in the corresponding studio here at Cranfield by my friends Steffi, Steffi Hussels uh, and Martin Spiller. Uh, there, where are they? There they are. It's good to see you both. Uh, just so you, in case you're wondering, that's Martin <laughs> waving madly. Martin, I believe you've just come back from skiing. So your legs are in their prime condition, I'm assuming. My legs are in okay condition, and I've got obviously a skier's full face tan. So. <laughs> <laughs> that breathing that you heard earlier on is from Martin. So Martin and Steffi, tell us more. What sort of lecture are you, you going to give us now? What sort of taste are you going to give us? So we are quite excited. We, we thought about, Martin and I, what we could do as we teach entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial finance. And Lauren already outlined entrepreneurship plays a key part on the MBA, not only for starting your own business, but also now in the corporate world. Because if we think of big blue chip companies, they want their staff to be entrepreneurial. So we thought we'd pick some pieces out of both, bring it together, and we'll explain a bit more in a second of what Brilliant. we'll cover. So Over to you then. Quite unique. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, we should say good evening, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. So um, we are here for entrepreneurship and the rule of five. And I think we will explain this in a second of what we what we will cover, uh, introduce ourselves and then sort of run through. As Toby mentioned up front, please, if you've got questions, put them in the chat. And we said they should um, interrupt us as they come in. So uh, questions are always good. And you can see we we do this sort of interchangeably. So and this is also what you will experience in the classroom. And um, Martin and I stand in the front teach together. Okay. Uh, hopefully we can have some slides so we can run you through. Yes. Brilliant. Super. So entrepreneurship and the rule of five, Steffi. Okay. I think we've done the welcome. So. Yep. So I think a little bit. Okay. Brief introductions and Lauren also mentioned and. Um, I'm delighted Stefanie Hussel is originally from Germany and this is what you will find faculty are from different parts of the world which adds another mix to I guess an international business school. Um, my role sort of is I'm the director of the Bettany Center for Entrepreneurship. You might say why called the Bettany Center because it was endowed by an alumnus who did his MBA in the late 60s and became a very successful entrepreneur and wanted to ensure that the future uh, classes of MBA students have the opportunity um, to really embrace entrepreneurship going forward. I've also got my finger in a few um, different pies. I'm particularly interested in entrepreneurial finance, family business. And uh, I think that's kind of it from me. Over to you, Martin. Uh, um, I like to do this introduction as the kind of justification because I'm not a doctor or a professor and in such illustrious company. Is my kind of justification for why I'm here. So I'm a part-time lecturer in entrepreneurship at Cranfield. I spend my kind of split my life in three. I lecture, I consult, and I have a very small investment portfolio. I'm a chartered accountant, so don't hate me for that. I'm ex-head of food and beverage for Deloitte & Touche. I'm also a barrister, so I set up my first business, a giftware company that I had a 20x return on. And then I decided I wasn't boring enough being an accountant. I'd better add a lawyer to that as well. So I'm actually a qualified but non-practicing barrister. And since then, like I said, I split my life in three. Bit of lecturing, bit of consulting, and a bit of investing. And in relation to what I do at Cranfield, I was also on an investment fund for super early stage seed enterprise investment level investment fund for four years. And now I've got my Cranfield role and three non-executive roles to go with it. But I'm going to get this out of the way because <laughs> Steffi loves to stitch me up. So if any of you do join Cranfield, you'll already know this. Um, I was a giftware entrepreneur. Giftware is uh, key rings, mugs, teddy bears. And to kind of prove what you need to go through as an entrepreneur, I am also a published poet. Uh, these beautiful mirror plaques are called Reflections on Life. Um, over the four or five years that we sold them in my giftware company, we had retail sales of over 45 million in the UK. They were sold in the USA, Canada and Ireland in English and translated in South Africa, Greece and Spain into those local languages. And the reason we put them up there is because Steffi thinks it's hugely funny that a gigantic fat Yorkshireman um, 
has written lots and lots of poetry, 132 of them over four years about mums, one I loves, I love yous. And the reason I did that is because the first uh, launch of my company, we had a big order for a different range. That range didn't go so well and the customer wanted to kick it out, but instead would take this new range and I had to suddenly realise that I can write sometimes with wine, sometimes with not, but sort of uh, poetry for people um, in an emergency. And Steffi always likes to stitch me up because obviously I look gigantic and I sound quite aggressive and I write uh, poetry like this. So hopefully that will give you some flavour as to what some of the lecturers, I think I stand alone on that one, but some of the lecturers are like at Cranfield. So think, why should we do the session, Steffi? Yeah, it's a very good point, Martin, because I think we, as, as was mentioned before, I said entrepreneurship plays um, an important part. And I think in the UK, we have six million businesses, um, out of which 99% are SMEs. Um, around 7,000 firms are large companies. And what you really see is what we want to see, how can you scale up businesses? What's really important is you need to understand two sides of the coin, and we'll explain that in a second. Um, but as I mentioned before, is entrepreneurship is not only about starting business, it's about scaling businesses up and ensuring also that big corporates understand really what it takes to be entrepreneurial and stay competitive. So a little bit more, Martin, what will it take? Well, I think for me, Steffi, the reason it's really exciting is never before has there been a time where the, the large companies of tomorrow are being built as we speak today. And so we've given an example of Deliveroo, which obviously Will Shu and Greg Orlowski founded, raising the very small amount of money in 2012. Uh, they raised £115,000 at £1.5 million pre-money valuation and obviously floated the company in 2021 at a £7.6 billion valuation, uh, raising across that time of the nine years £650 million. And the reason we're, I think we're super passionate about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial finance is that never before have, even if in the older days, maybe traditionally MBAs work in large companies, today they're working for all sorts of types of companies across the range. And even if you're not looking to work for a small company, the small venture capital backed company that you might end up working for tomorrow is being funded and developed today. So to understand that is super important. And delivery is just one of a number of examples that we could look at. And the other thing to consider, of course, is the other side of the coin. Um, and when we look at John Doer, who is a UN, US investor, he invests through Kleiner Perkins, he's a venture capitalist, and he's invested in companies like Compact, Amazon, Google, Microsystems, you name it all. And he actually says the best way to predict the future is to make it, the second best way is to finance it. And this is where really entrepreneurial finance comes in. So. What we hope is to take you know, some takeaways today is which really showcase you why, first of all, now entrepreneurship is important, why it's worth understanding entrepreneur finance um, in the big mix. So what are we going to cover, Martin? So where are we going to go today? We are now, you might say, what is the rule of five? So we're going to shed some light of why we call it entrepreneurship and the rule of five. And what I'd like you to think about is we're going to cover five things. And with each thing, we say maximum five sub points. So this is important. We're going to look at what we call CSF or critical success factor and um, key performance indicators and the confusion around it. And we also have some tips and tricks, which is really for entrepreneurs in this space. But also remember, it's not only for entrepreneurs, it's also for larger businesses. It's as relevant for you in a small space and in a larger setting. So. To kick us off, why rule of five? <laughs> so I'm a simple man, Steffi, and I like to think that you can make things most, um, boil them down to kind of an area. And I came across this piece of work by uh, Blick and Ravinovich, and they came up with this magic model seven, which built on some work in the 1950s. It's not, and you can read the source there, or we can share it out if you want to afterwards. It's, it's not the most exciting document, but what it actually piece of research shows that the human brain can deal with seven pieces of information plus or minus two. And I believe having had years, of, and uh, it was interesting that Lauren mentioned before about the mix of faculty. So obviously I, I come from industry, not from academia. Most businesses really struggle when you have much more information. So the human brain can deal with five pieces of information. It takes 50 times more effort to deal with 10. 
And if you want to prove that to yourselves, think about when you're trying to remember a, a phone number and how you break it down into steps. So what I believe is you need to keep things simple. And when you run a business, instead of the magic number of seven, we bring it down to a magic number of five and focus on what is critical in your business. Because if your brain's short-term capacity can't keep it at the forefront of your mind, the longer-term brain being more about um, dealing with uh, stories and images and feelings, if you can't keep it at the forefront of your mind, then you're not going to remember it and you can't enact it. And so what we're going to look at, hopefully, Steffi, is breaking the business down, focusing what's on critical, the critical success factors that we're going to focus on, then how do you monitor those with key performance indicators will actually enable you to drive the business forward. And I guess my one example before moving on is I was in a business that I'm now a non-executive director of, and I asked them what their values were. They had seven, and they couldn't remember them. And they had to go outside and read them off the wall. And to my mind, Steffi, and I'm, maybe people disagree, but if you can't remember them at the forefront of your mind, you can't enact them, you can't recruit them, you can't keep them, you can't live them. So what we're trying to advocate for this is you can, and we'll hopefully prove, and I'm sure some of you are saying, oh, that's great for small businesses, but hopefully we'll also prove that large businesses too can be broken down into this manner. And I think we start with, so John F. Rockhart, MIT Sloan School of Management, said that critical success factors are the limited numbers of areas which, if they're satisfactorily, will, will ensure that a successful competitive performance for the organisation. And he was building on a body of research from the Sloan School of Management and from before that. And I think the thing that we forget in this day and age of data and having available information is the idea, what's critical? That's not to say that other things aren't important or other things don't need to happen, but I would argue they're probably more hygiene factors. What are the critical things that set you apart from those of your competitors? And when I'm asked to do the work and when I'm talking with students, I would advocate that we start with our values. And so to give you an example, one of the companies, um, and those of you who know me, I'm not a big fan of, of um, economy airlines, largely because of my size. But one of the companies that I'm really impressed by is Southwest Airlines in America. Southwest Airlines started the kind of um, the, the low cost airline route in the 1960s. It's done a lot of practices removing the hub and spoke model of the flag carrier airlines moving to the kind of direct point to point. And it's done it all differently all the way through. And here are the four values that they espouse about warrior spirit, a servant's heart. And they have a golden rule, which is effectively treat others as you would to yourself. But they've maintained this and they spell this on purposely wrong, fun loving attitude. And wow, your customers. And I think that's a good place. These are the four things that make Southwest Airlines different. And they also make sure that your uh, employees live them. And we've got a quick video, which I, I really like, so hopefully you won't mind me dancing along with this. But I thought we could play this and, and you'd see, these are not just things that they talk about. These are things that they live and build their critical kind of success factor, their, their unique selling point on. So I'm gonna play the video now. Good evening, folks. Welcome aboard Southwest Airlines Flight 372, service to Oklahoma City. Those of you that have flown us before know that we do things a little bit differently here on Southwest. Some of us tell jokes, some of us sing, some of us just stand there and look beautiful. I, unfortunately, can do none of those. So here's the one thing that I do know how to do. We're going to shake things up a little bit. I need a little audience participation Otherwise, this is not going to go over well at all. So here's what I need, especially you guys in the front, because you know what's coming. All right. I need a beat. All right. All I need you to do is stomp and clap, and I'm going to do the rest, because I just, I've had five flights today, and I just cannot do the regular boring announcement again. Otherwise, I'm going to put myself to sleep. So you guys with me? All right. So give me a stomp, clap, stomp, clap. Come on, stomp, clap, stomp. Claps, they don't beat there. There you go. Keep that going. This is flight 372 on SWA. The flight attendant's on board serving you today. Teresa in the middle. David in the back. 
My name is David and I'm here to tell you that Shortly after takeoff, first things first There's soft drinks and coffee to quench your thirst But if you want another kind of drink, then just holler Alcoholic beverages will be four dollars If a monster energy drink is your plan That'll be three dollars and you get the whole can We won't take your cash, you gotta pay with plastic If you have a coupon, then that's fantastic We know you're ready to get to new places Open up the vents, put away your suitcases Carry on items, go under the seat In front of you, so none of you have things by your feet If you have a seat on a roll with the exit we're gonna talk to you, so you might as well expect it. You gotta help evacuate in case we need you. If you don't want to, then we're gonna reseat you. Before we leave, our advice is put away your electronic devices. Fasten your seatbelt, then put your trays up. Press the button to make the seat back raise up. Sit back, relax, have a good time. It's almost time to go, so I'm done with the rhyme. Thank you for the fact that I wasn't ignored. This is Southwest Airlines. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you very much for my beat. I appreciate that. You will not get that on United Airlines, I guarantee. <laughs> I think the interesting thing about that video is it shows two things. The first thing is don't rely on the guy in the front row for your beat because he can't hold a beat. But the second thing is, that it, that to me, it very much shows the values. And actually, if you, you go on YouTube or any of the Vimeo or anything else, you can actually find lots of videos of things from operatic performances to comedy performances, not just one person who raps. This is something they live throughout their airline. And so for the, the starting journey for critical, what's critical to you is values. And I guess, Steffi, the next place you look at is you kind of where you want to go. Yes. So as Martin said, values are very much the rule book for a business and they should really guide the rest. So what Martin also mentioned is to be the consistency that Southwestern Western Airlines shows is vital. And so it's the importance of remembering values and coming back to five. Five, we can maybe remember even three values. Definitely no more than five is important. So once we know the values, there are two more important things to look at. One is the vision for a business and one is the mission. So the vision is very much where you ultimately, um, what you ultimately want to become. So what's the path in the future? What's your sat nav in a car that you want to set your destination? And this is really, and you want to shape what does success look like? And as Microsoft put it as an example, to put a computer on every desk and every home, that was their vision to be. Um, the second important part then is the mission. So as I said, vision is ultimately what you want to become. Mission is what is the purpose of the business. So what are you in it for? And another great example that we all know is Google. So their mission or purpose, it was to organize the world's information and make it universally, universally accessible and useful. And that's very clear about what their purpose is. On this slide, you can see IKEA, who most of you will know as a business. They very much say their vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people, followed by their mission, which is our business idea supports the vision by offering a wide range of well-designed functional home furnishing products at low prices, so low that as many people as possible will be able to afford them. So they're very clear in terms of where they want to go and what they're offering. So we've got three important things already. What the values are, what's the vision, what's the satnav going to tell us, <coughs> and then what is the mission, so what, why are we in, in business? And I think it's interesting, Steffi, with the, with the, the IKEA one, you can almost feel Ingvar Kamprad in there telling the new management team after he left them a few years ago exactly what they should do and how they should run the business and be very clear about it. Yes. So the next thing is then you, know, you need to also define this, is define what matters to you. And what I mean with that is when we set this SADNAV, it's about understanding where are we now, where do we want to be, which is the vision, and then we need to develop that pathway, which is also the execution and the strategy. And I love this saying, and someone said this to me in the past, say, strategy without execution is a dream, and execution without strategy, a nightmare. So what we really want is we don't want, you know, we want a dream, we don't want the nightmare. So we very clearly need to understand, you know, where do we want to compete? Which markets are we in? Who are our key customers our, you know, that we are serving? Um, what makes us better, different, unique from everybody else out there? And um, what do we need to do better to really get this advantage to everybody else? And so what you need to keep in mind, what are the values, the rule book? What is the vision? 
and now actually how can we develop this execution? I think, Martin, you've got a good example to bring this a bit alive. Yeah, so I'm going to delve into the problem with a lot of this stuff is getting access to information. So I'm going to give you one from my company um, that I recently exited. I think it was July or August last year. It's a company called Sister Magic, a southwest based IT support business. As you can probably tell I like slightly different, slightly boring businesses. We did a buy-in, management buyout in 2016 with the managing director and I bought out the founder. The business had five staff and it was turning over just short of £500,000. We came together with a vision to grow the business and it has formed one of my exits. And the first thing we did was decide what our values are going to be now that we've got rid of the founder. It's time for a refresh. And we came up, we didn't go for five stuff. It kind of mm. undermines our process. But we came up with four things. We said we were going to do it differently. What does that mean? Well, most IC support businesses count you in for a year's contract. We do 30 days contracts for our support. We're going to do it with respect. So we don't allow customers to shout at our team. We're going to talk to people in plain English. And we're going to make sure that we put people before technology. We're going to do it with passion. You might find that kind of weird to do IT support with passion. But we were trying to make it as approachable and as, as relevant and have fun with our business. And we do it together. We stand as a team. We support each other. We don't let it. And we work with our clients as part of them. And we had a small vision. So it's there. We didn't want to become the biggest. We didn't want to dominate the world. But a leading boutique IT service provider to the SME sector. We didn't put a geography on it. But the word boutique was about selecting clients that worked for us. Mm. Once we put that in place, we came up with four critical success factors. And we'll talk about the KPIs and which I'll expand on them in a minute. But we said that in order to grow, we set ourselves a target of growing to 2 million revenue in five years. We said we need sales. So we'll work out how that works. We needed to retain some of our customers. But the first thing we did on taking over was sack one of our biggest customers that turned over 10% of our revenue because they weren't following our values of respecting our team and listening to our advice and working with us. We needed to put systems in place to retain people so that uh, we were losing a technician every 2.5 years. We needed to grow that because in order to grow the business, you need good people mm -hmm. and keep recruiting all the time is a waste of effort. And we put in some operational metrics to make sure that we were able to monitor when we needed new technicians, but also when people were overperforming or underperforming linked to our 30 day sales um, focus. So I think building on this, there's another sort of concept we're going to throw in. So we had values, we had vision, we had mission. And now I'm going to throw in what is called a B-hack. A B-hack is your Everest. And, you know, this gentleman here is, is really looking ahead. It looks quite far. It's pretty steep. It's pretty ambitious. And we call this the big, hairy, audacious goal for your business. And this is really what this is said on the slide. It needs to be motivating and demotivating. A lot of the time we find working with a lot of entrepreneurs is actually you can be, why not be ambitious? It takes the same effort to be ambitious than to think small. But when you think about a good B-hack in business, there are a few things to consider. It's very important they're aligned. So they need to align to the company strategy. And as Martin said, they need to be linked to the values throughout and also to the vision where you want to be. They need to be audacious. And that's why they're called a B-hack. Um, but I'd say they still need to be 70% achievable. If they can only be 10% achievable, it's also really demotivating for the team because it seems like we're crawling up this hill and we're never quite making it. They have to be articulate. Um, so it has to be clear and compelling. And this comes back also clear communication is vital, a bit like the values. You need to be clear about them. They need to be present, not only in spoken words, but also visually, because most, most of us also need the reinforcement through both. They need to be arduous. So they need to stretch your ability. If it's too easy to achieve, and you could say tomorrow we are there, you know, again, it's not going to motivate your staff. And in the end, we know entrepreneurship is a team sport. We want to get the best people in who want to be motivated and really help us climb this Mount Everest. And the last piece, it needs to be measurable. Um, because if it's not measurable, you can't actually reinforce it. You can't track progress. And you also can't figure out what works and what doesn't. And I think my favorite stuff is quite interesting because my favorite is um, when 
Phil Knight set up uh, Nike, which obviously is the Greek goddess of victory. He also said that there was one mission that he put up on the wall for his team, is that we're going to crush Adidas. It's, it's kind of ironic because I think it's fair to say that Adidas is hardly crushed. I don't know if, if at 32 billion euros of turnover you'd consider your, <laughs> your company to be crushed. But nonetheless, Nike was successful because Nike is at 40 billion euros and probably regarded in most categories as the leader. So a BHAG is a good thing. Um, I didn't go for a BHAG with IT support. Um, probably because it's quite hard to get excited about it. But a BHAG for launching ventures is is something we're quite interested in. It's quite a challenge. And I think the, the Crush Adidas one's a great example from, from, from Nike. If you've got your kind of critical success factors, like we had with Sister Magic or like with Nike and their BHAG, the next thing you know need to do is, is work out how you're going to measure it. So a key performance indicator, and notice this comes after critical success factors, not before. We see so many businesses at Cranfield that come through on our executive education side have put the cart before the horse in a bit of a way because they've got lots of KPIs, but they're not sure what they're actually pointing them to. So a key performance indicator is a measurable value that demonstrates how effectively a company is achieving that critical business objective, or in other words, critical success factor. So you need to align them and roughly, as a rule of thumb, 80%, four out of five of those factors are usually going to be financial in, in, in basis. Um, but you need to be careful when you're looking at KPIs because you need to make sure that the information you're getting is good because otherwise it's rubbish in and rubbish out. So it's something that we see a lot of in real life businesses, making sure that once you've got your critical success factors, you've identified some KPIs, that actually the information you're getting is leading you to that conclusion because otherwise you're monitoring the wrong thing. I promise you from System Magic, so this is obviously from our side, we decided it's really simple. We were getting enough sales leads. What we needed to do every month was have 332. So three was three new uh, sales to support contracts, three new product sales, and two projects. We weren't bothered whether the projects were completed because we can't control that, but what we needed to do is add them to the timeline. We then said, so that would lead us to the growth that we wanted to achieve. We then said we were gonna look at customer profitability. We didn't wanna work with clients who were costing us too much because they're not the right type of client for us. So we looked at customer profitability and we used to have benchmark matrix depending on turnover. We set ourselves a people turnover factor to reduce it to less than 10%. And we also identified that each technician had to do 30 events. Break it down pretty simply. A ticket, which is a fix a problem or answer the phone. The final elements, we had five KPIs for four CSFs. On the basis that our clients were on 30 day terms, we aligned that with a customer satisfaction matrix, which was made up with our own internal score linked to external kind of a net promoter score type data. So we would create a score that we would have a RAG, red, amber, green rating to say whether we think somebody's going to leave or somebody's going to stay so that we can monitor that. So those are our kind of five KPIs to four critical success factors. So it doesn't have to always align. But that enabled System Magic to grow from £500,000 uh, uh, turnover to £2 million in just over five years. And, and hopefully the business is going really well. I exited last year and the business seemed well placed to continue to grow based on those metrics. So what this really need to put in place then is, as we said, we started with the values. What do we stand for? And this is very much the rule book. We then said, actually, once you've got the values, it's the vision, which is what do we aspire to do? And what do we, and the mission, who do we do it for? And what's the purpose of the business? We then define the critical success factors, the goals. This is linked to the strategy um, and then have the really hands-on tactics in the day-to-day -day life. What's really important is to, in some ways, we set the values on the top because values lead to culture, which we know will give you a sustainable long-term advantage, but they are building blocks. So don't start with the tactics and then develop the values. Build it bottom up, values, vision, mission, goals, or critical success factors, KPIs in terms of strategy, and as Martin just outlined, really hands-on tactics.
But actually what we see, and mm. this is where I think Cranfield pulls itself uh, apart from maybe our competitors by having both the academic and the executive education experience, a lot of businesses start with KPIs. They read a report, they look at something online, and they start by looking at key performance indicators for their industry. They copy others, and that often leads to a lack of congruence between what you're trying to achieve uh, rather than um, what you're trying to put together, which is identifying what's really critical. So in the end, the, K, the, the KPIs become the end game. And my worst example, Steffi, was where they had 34 key performance indicators. Now, I've got a pretty good memory, as you know, but even I can't remember 34 things. And, and one might go further to say that you can't have 34 key things that you're monitoring in a business. So I just think it's worth pointing out that it, identifying what's really critical, what sets you apart, even in the biggest of businesses, can be very different um, from what you look at. And what a lot of businesses are doing is kind of KPI overload. And I'm sure you're sat there at home and it's kind of weird. It's definitely my first time in the studio, so I can't see you. But at home, you're saying, oh, larger companies are much more complicated. It's all very, very simplistic and you don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'll offer you this. Um, again, Steffi, I've failed because I've got six, um, but there's five, we'll go for six, then Louis Vuitton, LVMH, say they've got six things that they have to do. They have to operate a decentralized structure. They need to make sure they focus now on organic growth. I think uh, they've announced that they've pretty much completed their spending spree. They're looking at vertical integration across their businesses, which creates synergies. And they want a balance across the segments and the geographies. But one of the, I guess the sixth may be one of the most important for them is sustaining that savoir faire that sets them apart. So you might say that it's all about, and the, the examples I've given you are small businesses. The only reason I've given you a small business example is getting into that level of detail is something you can only do if you've got links to the companies that you're dealing with. But actually, even at the largest of companies, you know, some of the richest, one of the richest uh, entrepreneurs in the world, uh, they do it on based on six things, not five. So I think we can probably settle with that. Might be even one. Um, so North Star Metrics, which is another way for BHAGs. Um, Facebook is all about monthly active users and everything focuses around that. I think my issue probably with one is uh, the good things, and you can see them in green, it focuses on value and it's absolutely clear. So there's no doubt about what you want to do. The problem with uh, a North Star one metric, and maybe even the odd BHAG, is it reduces innovation because you're just focused on one thing. And it can be a bit backward looking because you're looking at something that's in the past, not necessarily measuring something for the future. But it's interesting to know that even with Facebook, a company that everybody regards as you know, is obviously hugely valuable, they don't have many overriding critical success factors to look at. Okay, so this is really to give you a very sort of quick entrepreneurship, we said, rule of five, the importance of values, vision, mission, B hacks, and KPIs in this. So what we now want to do is some sort of more three more takeaways that we've seen working with a lot of entrepreneurs and corporate entrepreneurs over the years. So Martin, what's key takeaway number one? Um, make sure that your critical success factors cover all the bases in the business so that they cover financial, customer, people, operation, whatever that might be. Uh, make sure that you're covering the basis of what's critically important to your business. Okay, don't just focus on one element because you like it, which is very um, something that's very tempting to do. Look at making sure that you cover all of the main bases, the business, and what will set you apart from your competition. So a lot of students are always wanting to reinvent the wheel when they come up with, come up with something amazing. For that, we would offer you things like Uber. You could buy a cab, you could rent a cab before by calling a number, or you could put your hand out in different places to hail a cab. Uber realized that with the smartphone generation and an app, they could build a market. So Make sure that when you're doing it, you focus on what's critical to your business, not necessarily um, just the things that you want to focus on. I think then key takeaway number two is I alluded, is we always say entrepreneurship. The first rule, which we actually haven't talked about, Martin, is cash is king. So for those of you who don't know, I mean, you can not be not profitable, but you can never run out of cash. 
The second more important is as entrepreneurship is a team sport. And again, as we what we've seen as working is what's very vital, you need to get your team rowing in the same direction. And that sounds easier said than done. And what we've seen is around 70% of businesses actually, 70% well, of businesses and the teams are not engaged. And what we see, this has a direct impact on performance. 30% are very engaged. You know, they're not just passengers on the boat and who want to go from one paycheck to the other, but they've really embraced the values, the purpose and want to make a difference. So what you really need to think about is, you know, who is involved and you need to promote the champions. You need to make sure that everybody sits on the right position of your boat. And um, you need to make sure, make sure they all know what part they play. And this links back to the KPIs. Do they really all know what is important, what makes a difference? And that eventually will also make a difference to them. And also say to them, actually, why is it important to you? And this is for as a CEO, as well as as the owner of the business, you know, why should the business work hard? And often we find if this again links back to the values, people don't join a company to make the owners richer, they join to make a difference. So what's really in being involve them in the creation, and actually really make sure to identify the true champions in it, who take your boat very fast on the river forward to reach that big, audacious BHAG. And I think the final thing to bear in mind, Steffi, is that your critical success factors change across the life cycle. Mm. One of the things linking back to our Deliveroo example, the founder still likes to go out and deliver on occasion to find out what's going on. So make sure that you recognize that it's a, the factors in your business will change as you scale up. And it's an ongoing process. So to give you an example, System Magic's 332 started out as 221 on the sales front. And factors change. So take away three, review, revise, and refine your critical success factors. One of the things I advocate working with the businesses that are either venture capital backed or growing themselves organically is make sure that you keep looking at your business plan. It's a living document rather than something you stuff in a drawer or put in um, a folder on your desktop or Dropbox, okay? So make sure that you keep reviewing, revising and refining the critical success factors and probably, Steffi, the KPIs that go with them, making mm. sure that you're targeting the right sort of benchmarks. But how many are there going to be, Steffi? Five. <laughs> and that's us. So really, is the last point is, I mean, what we try to do is give you a bit of a, um, a quick blast to some of the important points that we see in entrepreneurship and in business in general, points to five things to remember. Um, entrepreneurship is vital. If you want to follow us, you know, we wouldn't be an entrepreneurial center if we wouldn't say actually follow us. So the veterinary center, here are our tags. Um, we are on LinkedIn and we are on Instagram, etc. And for those of you, we do actually some great events. Also, you can join remotely. So do check out what we've been, what is coming up um, for us in the Bethany Center. And on that note, I think we head back to the studio. Brilliant, Stephanie and Martin. Thank you very much indeed. There's a question from Ram, uh, and I'm going to uh, abridge your question, Ram. Just remind us again, BHAG. BHAG stands for? Big, big Hairy Audacious Goal. There you go, Ram, Big Hairy Audacious Goal. Uh, and the addition there is, if you had to remember one thing from the presentation that you've just mm. given, what would it be? Uh, it's impossible, I know, to, for you to even say that. Oh, gosh. If it's, oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I think we both have maybe... Well, you give one, I'll give one. Okay, <laughs> so for me, the important thing is actually define your very values clearly and actually not only put a name down, but actually define them as a behavior because they are the rule book for your business. And that will dictate how you execute your strategy, who you hire, and the impact that you can generate. Wow. And for, me, and for me, I'd say everything breaks down to this rule of five. Everything you do can be broken down into five. If you can't remember it, you can't do it. So if you can't keep it at the forefront of your mind, you can't do it. So actually, five things. So everything I do, every presentation I've got, every slide I do, has that kind of rule of five as the guiding thing. So Because if I can't remember it and give it to you properly, you can't remember it either. Wow. So beyond Martin, beyond five, that's it. It all goes to pieces. Oh, I'm, I'm a very glad sim I did simple five Yorkshireman. Keywords now. <laughs> <laughs> five keywords from Lauren as well. Brilliant. 
please stay around, Martin and uh, um, Steph. Please stay around because we've got a ton of questions coming in and we've got a panel coming up. So please don't wander off just yet. Hopefully you got something from that presentation. This is a flavor. I think this, it's fair to say, Steffi and Martin, this is not a lecture that you normally give. This is a kind of a combination or a hybrid. Um, yeah. So this is a flavor of what's coming up. I'd like you to take away from that personally, um, the interactivity or, or the chance to ask questions just being posed at you. And I think it's fair to say, Steffi and Martin, if you're in a classroom or possibly even a Zoom session on your own, you'd be firing questions back and forth to the audience uh, pretty much all the time. I'm assuming you're going to say yes to that. Yes, no, I think what is really important is what we do now is it is quite, I mean, there are two, maybe three things to take away. One is <laughs> actually the link, you know, coming back to our theme, I can't think of five it is so quickly, but it's actually the link between industry. So, you know, you've got academia and industry. So Martin actually having been there, done it, is his role as a barrister, entrepreneur and investor. And um, so bringing those two worlds together, that is one important thing. That it is interactive. Um, what we would do in a real class, we would really hope to get question. And I always say it's a conversation because there is so much knowledge and expertise in the classroom that if I can leave the class, I've learned something. Actually, the class has been successful because it's a different nuances from different cultures and countries that make it really exciting. And I think the third is, as we said, yes, we made it and um, we made the session for this. But what also makes Cranfield in a way stand out is and it shows in the session, it's it's about the, the applicability. So the examples that were in here is also what we find is, for example, working on the business growth program, which is the longest owner managed program in the country, which helps businesses scale up. So what we picked is based on academia and it also is practice and bringing this together. So these are my three. Debbie, thank you very much. And for everyone online, you've got the best. You've got the best uh, of Cranfield there. Thank you. Like I say, please stick around. I'm going to move now and change tempo to join, have join us uh, some students from the course, from the MBA. And I think this is also, uh, and possibly more so the lecture, your chance to ask questions of the students. And here they are. Uh, here, these are real students. Uh, what it's really like to be on the course. Um, and I'm going to start, Stephen, with you, if I may, because, Stephen, you're an alumnus. You've been on the course. You've been in the position of people on the call today wondering whether to come on the course. You've come on the course and now you've left. Tell us what was your student journey like uh, and then how did you leave and what are you doing now? And Stephen, you're on mute. <laughs> Easily done. And you're still on. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> Yay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, Stephen Coucher. I yeah, was studying at Cranfield from 2017 through to 2018. So gosh, how time flies three and a bit years ago already. Um, uh, I, uh, subsequent to leaving Cranfield, kind of like a, this really, I think, kind of reiterates the, the masterclass by Steffi and Martin. I started up my own company. I went down the entrepreneurial kind of like journey, the route, um, and I started up an e-commerce stroke fashion company. My background actually is hard finance. I worked in the city for 15 years and uh, we were talking about transitions and that was quite a transition, let me tell you. Um, crunching numbers kind of like in one career and kind of a year later after Cranfield, basically kind of uh, delving into the world of uh, sustainable fashion. Uh, that was all going quite well. Um, uh, it was slightly derailed by COVID. So kind of we put it on a back burner for, for a year. And um, I, despite my protestations kind of like uh, before I joined kind of the Cranfield MBA about not going into consulting, I've actually now also started up my own consulting firm. And uh, I do consulting basically with uh, startup companies. Uh, helping them raise venture capital and also private equity capital as well. So for me, kind of a, the reason I did the MBA was to change my career from kind of like look ridiculously long hours in the city, kind of like a, please don't feel sorry for me, um, uh, to, to hopefully be able to do something else kind of more entrepreneurial, to be my own boss, to be the master of my own destiny uh, and to start up my own company. I think the MBA not only gave me the, the foundations of knowledge, kind of wisdom, experience, but also, also importantly as well, the confidence to be able to do it. Um, kind of, it seemed like a, a huge, great kind of undertaking, I think, before I started the MBA to, 
to to figure out all the bits and pieces to to all the moving parts and uh, you know all of the different areas which a business encompasses um having kind of learnt about all of the respective areas kind of uh, and meeting some great people kind of getting encouragement from people like Steffi um kind of yeah, my, my confidence kind of uh, really was just uh, you boosted and uh, you know I was thankful not only to, to pick up the, the knowledge and the expertise during my year at Cranfield but definitely as well kind of like the belief in myself the belief that I had the ability to do it to go out there and get it done. Stephen can I ask you then in terms of what you just heard from Steffi and Martin what would you say to people who are a little bit intimidated by that and that have no experience of that? What's your suggestion? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I, everybody has to start from the beginning at some point. Um, and kind of, uh, you know, you hear it time and time again from, from kind of, you know, people like uh, Steffi and Martin, kind of, uh, you know, if you've got an idea at one stage, you, you're just going to have to go for it. Kind of, you know, you can think about it forever. You can talk about it forever. Um, you just need to make the plunge. Kind of like, a, you know, no plan is ever perfect, I think, when you start out. You can get caught into the trap of thinking that kind of everything needs to be thought out kind of like really thoroughly and kind of, you know, all of the bits and pieces need to be in place. I think the key is just to get going and kind of, you know, hopefully kind of the bits and pieces that aren't yet in place when you do start will fall into place pretty quickly. You gather the team around you, kind of you're able to access finance, but, uh, but the key is just to make the plunge to get going. So Stephen, there's a question for you from the audience and Ram, thank you very much indeed for your question. Um, the question, Stephen, is as follows. Uh, what would you change if you're going to go back to the Stephen of 2017 and evaluate in the MBA options? What would you go for? What different formats or different schools or different specializations? If you had your life again, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> what would I change? Um, gosh, that, that, that's a good one. Um, I, I guess kind of um, I would be braver right from the outset, kind of. Yeah. I thought that I would start my own company, but it was probably only around kind of semester three, beginning of semester four, which is kind of like a June time, I guess, that kind of yeah, I really seriously be, uh, began to, to, to kind of write up business plans and to kind of like get the ball rolling. Um, I wish I had taken the plunge in terms of just using the resources around Cranfield, the expertise around Cranfields, you know, the potential access to capital kind of that the Cranfield could introduce to me kind of earlier in my MBA year, which is not necessarily easy because there's so much going on because it's a fairly intensive kind of like workload. I think kind of we, we would all find kind of studying for an MBA. Um, but that, that's probably the takeaway. But um, kind of, you know, I got there in the end. So kind of, uh, you know, it, it all came good in the end. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we've actually had a question come through. Um, so for Martin and Steffi, um, Xavier says, I'm starting a small business focused mainly on bespoke, one of a kind products. Other than revenue and profit, what's a good way to measure the success of business and improve on my products? Um. Oh, wow. Uh, at a startup level, I would be looking at good customer feedback, engagement with your different channels, probably the numbers of people hitting your website rather than all of the kind of transaction basis, people signing up to your email marketing campaigns. Kind of traction points would be what, as an investor, I would look for and as an entrepreneur, I'd want to have rather than just pure sales. Well, Thank you. Martin, thank you. Uh, Joseph, I've got a question for you back to the students. Um, tell us more, Joseph, if you're there. And I know, uh, I think you're based on campus at the moment. Tell us more, Joseph, about your experience of studying the MBA. Uh, thank you, uh, Toby. Um, so to start uh, uh, in the, at the beginning, uh, the university's response to COVID was excellent. Uh, so the international students were given free pickup, accommodation, and food during the starting quarantine days. Also, there was provision for frequent COVID testing, and also the small cohort size uh, allowed us to safely have face-to-face -face lectures without a worry. Um, so coming to the lecture, lecture part, uh, the teaching staff in Cranfield is outstanding. Uh, the modules are very practical and the professors are very approachable. The leadership module was my favorite uh, because it fundamentally changed, changed my outlook towards uh, processes and people. So 
there are uh, a lot of uh, things happening uh, other than uh, the regular classes. Uh, there were entrepreneurship speaker series, uh, which involved uh, interaction with alumni who successfully started their own venture. Also, the Bethany Center also has a mentoring program. Uh, I had a business idea and uh, the center appointed uh, a mentor to me uh, to coach uh, and guide me towards uh, at the idea stage. Uh, also, the career team uh, at Cranfield is very approachable, uh, where uh, we can book an appointment uh, with a career team person with just a click of a button. Um, so the, the MBA is the flagship program of the school, and the school really treats it like that. We had uh, some new sessions such as executive coaching sessions and career coaching sessions this year. And uh, uh, I, I found them pretty positive. Um, overall, to sum up, uh, I found the MBA as very intense and transformative. So it definitely exceeded my expectations. And uh, yeah, I can say that I'm not the same person I was six months ago. Wow, Josie, that's quite quite an endorsement there. Use that transformative word, which uh, Lauren. Picked up that one. Bonus <laughs> <you were>. point. <laughs> uh, Joseph, I've got another quick question. Um, think back to yourself when you were thinking about doing an MBA. Why did you choose Cranfield? Um, well, uh, I selected Cranfield mainly for its strong alumni base, uh, teaching uh, strength, and uh, mainly about the small cohort size. Uh, so. When I spoke to previous students, they only had good things to say. And I also wanted to be in a university uh, in a kind of environment, uh, uh, an open environment rather than a constrained building uh, like we see in London schools. Uh, and overall, Grandfield seemed like a perfect fit. Whoa, nice. You heard it here first. You got a question? I do, actually. And I was thinking about... Uh... When is it right time to start a business? Mm -hmm. We've got people saying, what should you do, being braver? And actually, I was thinking about the practical experience that you get at Cranfield from be learning the beginnings of starting your own business. And actually, I thought it'd be a, an interesting uh, segue into the, the venture capital uh, investment competition, the VCIC. And I believe Dean and Daniel both recently participated in this most recent rounds of the competition. Um, Dean, do you want to maybe start us off for a little bit about that experience? Yeah, no worries. So you, you really act out a venture capitalist situation where you're acting as the venture capitalist and you get a number of entrepreneurs pitched to you. So you'll see three pitches from three different entrepreneurs and you need to judge them, do some due diligence and ultimately develop a term sheet. And that term sheet you then take to a partner's meeting and they question you as well around why you've put those particular terms in. And ultimately, you're judged as a team on how you've performed in the term sheet, in your interactions with the entrepreneur, and then how you've answered the questions. And it was something I never thought I would be involved with. However, after sitting through some of Steffi and Martin's classes, which aren't too dissimilar to what you've just seen, it, it really sparked a bit of an interest into me that this is something completely different to my engineering background that I thought could be something to be explored a bit further. So I got involved in the competition. Um, we were fortunate enough to win the regionals um, in Europe, um, hosted by IESA, and we're, we're shortly going off to America to compete at the global finals. So that's we're rapidly preparing and looking forward to it. That's amazing. I mean, huge congratulations. I wondered if you're going to actually bring up your results, if you're going to talk about the competition, very humble. Um, so <laughs> D Daniel as well, what are the next steps of that competition? Sort of how is it helping you understand the journey of an entrepreneur? So I think touching on what Dean had said, um, one of the core parts of this goes back to a question that one of the prospective students had around what are the, the key things for them to be looking at. And Martin spoke about how you try to, to develop traction, how you try to develop some momentum in the market. 
And one of the things that we have to do is assess very quickly across um, a short amount of time, does each business have a, a market that it is able to penetrate? Does it have a growth potential? How is that company behaving in that market? And is it um, exhibiting all of the right things you'd want to grow? And so that is uh, it's a fantastic grounding for all of us in not only starting a business, but assessing what we're doing within our current um, education and future jobs as well. Um, and as Dean said, we go to, um, to North Carolina for, I think it's about 10 days time now. We get uh, two days to prepare with three potential um, businesses, and then it's 24 hours of nonstop sitting around and working very, very hard. Daniel, would you say you're in education now or the real world, in quotes? Sounds pretty real to me. It's a very good question. I, you know, I have a 16-year background in, in tech, and I've never been put in a situation quite like this that is put in every piece of information and, and knowledge that I'm sort of acquiring to the test. This is, these are real companies. This is not a, a fictional thing. These are real companies looking for real funding and we sit with real VCs. So um, for all intents and purposes, it, it is the real world. Um, we get treated by the VCs as if it is the real world, as if we are their employees and they, they like to do their best to um, try and be as challenging as possible. So if you want a, a ground in, in being in a an environment with a high pressure, this is definitely one to get involved with. Well, that's not too too much higher pressure to put people off, I'm sure. I'm assuming, Daniel, but just enough. <laughs> and then, Daniel, whilst you're there, um, why did you choose Cranfield? So I think this is one of the reasons. One of the key things for me would be, how can I put myself out of my comfort zone? How do I move outside of the things that I'm familiar with? 15 years working within business operations and strategic projects may sound wonderful for me it was but coming here and expanding uh, my horizons has been very challenging you know, the, the VCIC piece is one thing I wanted to get involved with but I've had the opportunity to work with a very diverse cohort across a number of competitions um, some of which recently we've been very successful with like the Climate Hackathon, which is supported by the Bethany Centre and NatWest. Um, and working with a, a group of people who have such a, a diverse set of experience and skills from doctrine all the way through engineering. Um, they challenge us, they test us, they help us see things in, in new ways. And across the, the whole cohort, including in, um, some of the some things that have happened in the last few weeks, Cranfield's having a very successful year with all of these uh, competitions, the inter-university competitions. I wanted to put myself out of my comfort zone and try some of these things. I've been fortunate to be a part of them and, and win some with people like Dean and others. Um, and I feel very fortunate to do so. It's amazing. It sounds incredibly diverse. Um, Dean, I was wondering, obviously we've talked about the, the recent VCIC competition, um, but what about your other highlights from the year? What, what are your highlights so far? So I think, I mean, it's it's been a very, very full on six months. So there's so many things I could call out right from the start. Our first week was a very immersive O week where we got to know each other better. We got to understand what's going to happen. And it was just a whole lot of fun. So, so that was something there, but then there's been lectures there's been talks. Joseph has touched on some of them. A, a real highlight for me was some of the Bethany Centre entrepreneur talks. And it really highlights the power of the alumni that Cranfield do have. You get access to some very, very interesting people who are more than welcome to share their experience and stories and really let you question and be involved and, and take from their learnings um, of experience, which which is really, really great. And the alumni, I, I think I will go back to the VCIC just briefly because the power of the alumni really highlighted it for me through that process. We had so many people who have been involved as entrepreneurs or as venture capitalists come out and help and support us through our preparation for that competition. And it really does just show the power of the alumni that Cranfield have and it's been a really, really hot, good highlight for me. Dean, thank you. I've got a question for Stephen. 
Um, and there's something that's come in from Ram uh, around the ecosystems of alumni. First of all, do you know anything about the ecosystems of alumni in India? I'll let you answer that one first, and I've got a follow on from that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, alumni, <laughs> the, the alumni network in India. Yeah, I don't know if you're connected to that or if you're aware of that sort of thing. Uh, that there's always a sizable, from what I understand, percentage of the cohort at Cranfields that that kind of you know, comes from, let's say, non-European countries, kind of, uh, and you know, the Indian community within the cohort is a very important kind of a constituency. Um, uh, I I think kind of in my year, 17 to 18, um, about kind of uh, over 10 percent of the cohort was Indian. And, you know, there is a strong alumni network now, kind of like I think in India, kind of like uh, from Indian students kind of uh, that, that have been through the program. So, Steve, is it fair to say that the alumni department or the, the section here at Cranfield do put on um, events um, uh, in touch with you a lot? You, you can feel free to get back in touch and join join online events. Absolutely. Um, kind of, you know, regularly receive email invites from uh, the alumni kind of uh, network at uh, Crown Fields. Kind of, uh, they organize kind of uh, speeches uh, from business leaders still for the alumni to, to connect into um, events um, and kind of uh, the, the, the alumni network as well. You know, often between themselves kind of organize social events and networking opportunities. For example, there's networking events kind of on a regular basis in the big cities in the UK and other big cities around the world. So it's a very active alumni network and it's really up to individuals, you know, how, how they participate in that and how much they get involved. Absolutely, and I would actually add to that as well because um, in the School of Management, when we're running our marketing events and we are we run thought leadership events, we have we did an amazing event for women in leadership. Actually, we ran in this studio last month and we had 1,700 people register. The alumni get access to all of those. So um, they continue to be a part of the, the celebration of all this knowledge that we have in the faculty. Um, and they continue to have access to all of that sort of information. Joseph, you mentioned careers. Um, what sort of career support do you get when you're an MBA student? I think you mentioned careers, didn't you? Uh, well, the uh, careers team really helps us in every respect, uh, starting off from uh, what you want to do, what can you do, and uh, how to get there. So uh, it involves a lot of uh, uh, CV prep and uh, a lot of counseling and uh, it also involves uh, a lot of uh, industry experts coming in to speak with us so yeah it has been outstanding uh, uh, they are very approachable and uh, we really can connect to them uh, literally anytime we want thanks joseph um i've got a question I guess if you're online and you're wondering, is Cranfield for me? Uh, and I think uh, Steffi and Martin, you're just as able to answer this one as well as uh, the students and, and Steve. How do you know that you're going to fit in to Cranfield? It sounds quite pressured uh, from what Daniel said there. How do you know? Anyone, anyone can answer that question. Steffi, Martin. Okay, I mean, I think for me is if you want to come to Cranfield, be curious, be bold, and I think um, be open to be challenged and challenge yourself. And I think that is the, there is no one ingredient for it, but I think some of the characteristics that MBA have shown over the years really bring this in front. And what I always used to say when the term start is, I think you want to be someone who wants to really consider what footprints you want to leave behind. But it's a real mix. It's like a good soup. I like cooking. The more spices you sprinkle in, you know, the more tasty it becomes. And an MBA is a little bit like that. So Sp be curious and be bold. Spicy, a spicy mix there. Yes. And, and I think you're right. There's absolutely no one single fit. And I think we do see a mix of people coming for entrepreneurship for, for your, your role in, in this, Steffi and Martin. But they've also got people who are looking to change uh, locations, change industry. Um, so I would say just for anyone who's wondering if they are the right fit, first of all, just book a call and have a chat because it is a really personal process. I think you've got to find the place that feels right to you. So we do have book a call functionality on our website. Just ask people to have a chat. 
One of the questions we do get as well is about scholarships and funding. Um, I've seen a little bit on the chat about that at the moment. Um, I don't know actually if anyone on the call, Dean, I know you received a scholarship. What was your experience? How did you find out about the scholarships? Yeah, so I, I guess I've spoken a little bit about it already, and that's the alumni. And I actually found out about the scholarship through alumni when I was doing my research as to which MBA, which university should I go to. And I knew a few people that had been here, um, and they told me that Australia runs an alumni scholarship um, and really opened, opened my eyes to the opportunity that Cranfield has, but also the options around scholarships and and they were a really good sounding board to go back and forth with around application processes additional information that you're you're required to do for the scholarships um, and in addition to that there's a really good i guess explanation of all the different scholarships and funding that cranfield offer on the site so i i found out a bit it through the back door um, just by talking to people and then was fortunate enough to go successfully through that process and, and be the recipient of one. Yep, fantastic. And you're right, there are an awful lot. And we have, there's, some of them are based, based on geography, some are based on industry. We have ones based on diversity. There's a women in leadership one. And we have, there, there's, there's all sorts of opportunities available and I think you're right it is down to that alumni network because that's where a lot of our scholarships are funded from and we do have a really engaged alumni network and they're passionate about paying it forward and making sure other people have access to that same education. Dean we're glad you found out about that one. <laughs> Steffi I've got a question for you and this is about uh, career opportunities after and I guess it's also for Stephen as well because Stephen you're, you're there. What and this is Ibrahim that's asking this one what are the employment opportunities after studying an MBA at Cranfield? Gosh, I mean, I think in terms of employment, I guess I come from the role of being entrepreneurial. But what I think I always say to students, it's as much as you put in is what you will get out. So we have a career team that will support you. But the more you set yourself apart throughout the MBA, and this is whether it's at Cranfield or somewhere else, like the students said, take part in competitions, that will really enhance your CV. However, I should say, with a warning also, an MBA is not going to be the magic wand uh, which is going to suddenly transform you from this level to this level. It's a process and it's part of the journey, but it can be transformative in you deciding what you really want to do, set your goals and then make a plan to achieve those steps going forward. Uh, Stephen, can I ask you too, um, in terms of your experience, uh, and it ties into a question, and, and Martin, I need to come to you as well, but it ties into a question that Ram is asking about the value of the Cranfield brand. Stephen, did that help you then in getting uh, your, your, your job roles? Uh, the, the, the Cranfield brand is very, very strong and recognised, I think, by most big employers, you know, certainly in the UK and kind of around the world, so mostly in Europe as well. I mean, again, kind of my journey probably wasn't quite kind of the stereotypical kind of MBA graduate journey, having started up my own company. Um, kind of, you know, I didn't necessarily have to go through that kind of meet employer process kind of after I graduated. Um, but, uh, you know, I reiterate what, what Steffi mentioned, kind of, you know, it's uh, that the MBA is not a magic wand. It's not going to get you that big job. You know, you still have to work very hard during your MBA year, from what I understand, basically to open doors for yourself, kind of, um, you know, the uh, your career path kind of uh, and your ability to get a job really starts, I think, from day one at Cranfield in terms of kind of sitting down with the careers service, the careers team, mapping out kind of your journey throughout the year, who you should be, who you should be speaking to. Um, kind of the information that you need to kind of like find out about what you want to do, um, kind of networking with the alumni network as well, which is absolutely critical, kind of given the size of the alumni network is now spread around the world, you know, undoubtedly kind of if there is a company that you particularly want to work for, there will be a Cranfield alumnus working for that institution that could give you some insights in terms of, you know, who to potentially contact, kind of what it's like to work there kind of uh, the recruitment process, et cetera. So, you know, again, the alumni network is extremely beneficial and helpful for, for us graduates to, to help us find jobs post-Cranfield. 
And Martin, following on from what Stephen's just said there, uh, Stephen just mentioned there's no magic wand. Darn, I thought there was. What, what is it? Is it down to personality, to character, to knowledge for people to land jobs? I'll be honest with you, Toby, I'm probably not the right person to ask for a job. I left corporate land at 28 and uh, having a contract at Cranfield is my first contract of employment we worked out for for 20 years. I think what I would say, echoing Steffi's comments and others, there is no magic one. Just having a Cranfield MBA is probably not enough. But there is lots of opportunity to get out what you put in. So the guys who are you know putting in extra time doing VCIC, that gets them noticed with lots of venture capitalists, real life venture capitalists. The alumni network is very strong, but also there's lots of opportunities to rub shoulders with big corporates. So I don't think I'm the man to give careers advice because I would really strongly suggest that nobody follows sort of follows me down that route. But uh, I think overall, what I've seen in my time at Cranfield as a kind of part time faculty now and before that as a visiting fellow is those people who do best are the ones that put in the most. If you just come along, do the do the core bits, then you'll do fine. But you, if you really want to start stand out, then you know, put in what you get out. And there's lots of opportunities to do that across. You know, we've talked about the Bethany Centre, and obviously we're super proud of what we do. But there's all sorts of other things across campus opportunities to work with, um, as some of our MBAs have done with uh, in kind of um, en engineering partners. So for me, it's. You get out what you put in, but in terms of careers, I, I think I'd leave it there as my advice. Well, yeah, and yeah, it was speaking to a millionaire poet. So, Martin, I think you're being very <laughs> modest there. Yeah, I was. I was very much the entrepreneur doing his own thing. So, I'm still. <laughs> I'm still scared every day that I have a contract of employment and could get, get into trouble. You still got a chance to ask a millionaire poet uh, a question. So, please keep those questions coming, Lauren. You got a question? I did actually. Um, and you're right. The ingredients are all there for success, but I think. Thinking about the word brand that that Ram mentioned there, um, I would say that actually the brand is is a it's a strong brand. As I mentioned before, we had those rankings earlier. We have we're a top ten Financial Times institution in the UK, and you look around at where our alumni are placed. And Stephen's absolutely right; they're embedded in all sorts of organisations, and they're a great way to get your foot in the door to have those conversations. But there are also an awful lot of them at the top. When you look at sort of some other financial banks, we have uh, on, on C level, we have alumni there, and we have one of our alumni is Dragon's Den. We, there are lots of high profile people. So I think there is a real perception of the, the quality that comes with a Cranfield MBA. I think as well, we're talking an awful lot about the, the career aspects. I think at a certain level, a lot of these MBAs are. All, all good for your career. So I think there's a, there's a question to be asked about life at Cranfield and what, what it's actually like day to day. That's that what, your, what is your experience going to be? And Daniel, actually, I was wondering if you might be able to give us a little bit of insight into life at Cranfield in terms of what do you do on the weekends? Where are the transport links? What sort of activities can you get involved on campus? Absolutely. So um, before I do that, I'll just touch very briefly on uh, the point around the, the environment here and uh, the point mentioned earlier around the, the pressure. You get to set how engaged and how challenging your year is here. One of the best things is it's for you to decide how far out of your comfort zone you want to be. This is a year out of industry where you get to test everything. And the only thing that can happen here is if you fail, you learn. There's no consequences, there's no negatives. That's why you're here, is to put yourself in those situations. And so then the environment around that is, is very wonderful. So this is a, a location in the middle of absolutely nowhere in the grand scheme of things, if you think about city base. Um, it has its own airstrip. It has, uh, which is probably the reason why it's uh, out of in the middle of nowhere. Having said that, you're only... 20 minutes on a bus from Bedford, from Milton Keynes, from some really big hubs. And one of the good things about that is you are focused when you're here on your education, your learning, your relationships and building the networks. But you know that you're never far away from the other fun things if you want to do them. And from Milton Keynes, you can be in London in about 25 minutes. 
Uh, you can be in Birmingham probably in about 40 minutes. So you have the links and the network to get wherever you want, whenever you want here, but also a very intimate environment in which you can focus and, and learn. Um, now, we have our own sports centre here, which is, has lots of different sports clubs. There's the um, all the, the fields around here which have rugby and, and cricket. There are many facilities for sport. Outside of that, there are so many wonderful um, groups from whether it's cycling to public speaking and many things in between. If you have an interest in particular in other industries that are focused here around uh, agriculture, engineering, you want to go and see the Formula One cars that we have here, you want to go and see the, the aeroplanes, you can always go and drop in and do so. So you'll never find yourself bored here, but when you need to get your head down, it's a fantastic location to do so. And Daniel, why why the full-time MBA and not the executive MBA? What was your choice there? So for me, um, the opportunity to have time out from, from a career, to focus solely on this, spend 12 months indulging in myself and my development to learn more about who I am, how I operate and how I can improve, was something that I thought made some feel a little bit selfish. But now being six months in was by far the best decision I've ever made. What I'm learning and what I'm able to um, to get my head around what is important to me and what I want to do for the next 20, 30 years of my life has been absolutely core. For me, the part-time MBA um, wouldn't have given me the same opportunity balancing that with the work. So um, for, this, for me, this was the only way to go. Um, and I'm very thankful I chose it. I, th I think you're right. It's... We talk about the MBA being transformative, and I think transformation takes dedication, it takes time, it takes the investment in yourself to, to prioritise yourself and your, your development in that way. It's very hard to strike that balance when you're still keeping the boss happy in, in your existing job. Um, as Steve and Joseph, Dean and Daniel, all four of you are successful in your applications to Cranfield, so actually, I was wondering if there are any tips that you have, and um, perhaps start with Stephen, on how to how to make a successful application. What should people be thinking about? Oh, very good question. Um, um, often, uh, in fact, I think kind of Cranfield will always ask uh, potential students to do a brief presentation within uh, the actual interview itself. I, I would suggest that kind of uh, if you are interested in applying and kind of you are invited to, uh, to an interview, kind of do take time to do some preparation in terms of some research on the actual underlying subject and also do uh, some uh, preparation on the delivery as well. Now, there's a very good reason that Cranfield asks students to do a brief presentation in that kind of uh, you will find yourself during your MBA year at Cranfield kind of like trotting down to the front of the lecture theatre on regular occasions and actually doing either a group presentation within your learning team or an individual presentation. And it becomes kind of habitual because you do it so frequently. And it's kind of about the process as well, about being able to condense kind of like uh, information that you've kind of researched and summarised very, very quickly and to be able to present that articulately as well. So that's a very important part of the interview, which Cranfield takes very seriously. And uh, I got a question from Abiram, and I'm Joseph. I'm going to put that to you first, if I can. Um, Abiram is really interested in extracurricular activities. So when you're not doing your MBA, what are you doing? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the sports are uh, especially is pretty big, and uh, uh, I, for that matter, go there every day. <laughs> so it involves. It's very big. It has. Uh, World class gym uh, and a lot of sports. Um, and if you are particularly interested in any sport, there is always a club for it. And uh, yeah, the university is pretty large with uh, a lot of ground space. And uh, yeah, uh, inside the campus, these are the things one can do. And uh, outside the campus, there is always uh, good fun stuff at uh, Milton Keynes and uh, Bedford. Joseph, thank you. Dean, is there life outside on MBA? There is. It's, it's a pretty intense program. So there is a lot of time 
spent studying with your learning teams, interacting with those relationships. But there is also life outside of the MBA. And, and for me, I think that's important to have a level of life outside of that. Um, for me, the release is sport. So I'm quite actively involved in a number of the sports uh, that are offered. But there is also a CSA, which is a social club on campus. Um, if you wanted a drink, they've got music groups and there's a few pubs in town if you wanted to get a little bit further away from the direct campus um, and have a quiet pint and watch a, watch a soccer match somewhere. So <laughs> there is other things uh, that you can get involved in. And I think it is important at times to, to make sure you do have that life outside of just a bit more than the study Other and thoughts it's important are to build those relationships <laughs> yeah dean thank you and dan it sounds like you're too busy studying to do anything else uh, not at all uh i'd say one of the key skills that you learn is uh when it's put in words on a piece of paper or speaking is brevity one of the skills they teach you is how to be quicker at digesting and understanding information and what's important and leaving what's not. Um, all these opportunities that we're provided um, to, to go out and do other uh, extracurricular activities is, is something that you find the time for. Um, and everyone who has passed over a year from year, and I'm sure Stephen would say the same, is this is what you make of it and you've got the opportunity to, to do so. And I think one thing that I'd like to just add on to what um, Stephen said, I think it's very important for your applications. It's be yourself. One of the things that I know I considered when I was applying and, and other people here did was, what is it Cranfield are looking for? And you start to think that maybe you're going to try and answer the questions on your application to what you think they want. Well, the reality is, they want lots of different people with different understandings, different experiences, different ways of, of life. Because it's when you bring together so many diverse ideas and concepts and, and ways of approaching things together that you really get the most out of it. So be, um, be, be clear about who you are and what you bring to it and put that down and be very honest because that's what they're looking for. Dan, just stick around. There's a question to you from Ram. Um, and to Joseph, uh, from YouTube videos, I learned that as a person, the MBA program develops you. Can you talk a bit about how is that tra transformation happening to you from before joining the MBA to now? Dan, you go first. How is that transformation, which you've heard the word several times today? How is it, with, how is it for you? So, so one of the things uh, I think actually Dean and Joe both mentioned it in the first term, one of the modules, and I don't want to give too much away, but <laughs> oh. you are put you are put into to learning groups and put under some pretty difficult um, circumstances. Um, it, not in a in a bad way, in a very constructive way, and you have to to not only learn about how you react to situations, but take feedback, very honest and open feedback from a lot of people about how you interact with them in meetings, in different situations, and some of the feedback you get. It's, it's so spot on to help you understand why um, people's perception of you in your life before the MBA has been the way it is. It makes you think about it. It helps you understand the impact of how we behave and actually how we can change that through aligning to our motivations to make sure that we are delivering on who we want to be. And it puts you in that little um, situation of really having to, to work it through. It's very difficult. You have to um, get some pretty direct feedback, but it's all um, with the intention of helping you to grow. So your transformation in that sense is whatever you think, however good you are coming in, there's so much for you to learn. For me, some of the feedback has been so good and I can go back to these people now and, and get updates as to how I am improving or where the areas that I should be changing are. And when I go back, because I'm here most of my time and see people in my life who are not from the university, they notice not only the way that I behave differently, but the way that I will, for example, be asking more probing and understanding questions than offering up um, answers to them on things. I think that's a fab answer, Daniel. Um, you mentioned that you, you were looking for that transformation. Did you already have a goal in mind about what you wanted to do? Or have you, how did you approach 
the decision in making to do an MBA, did you already know what you wanted to do with the MBA afterwards? Or is that that transformation, the experience in itself that you're looking for? Um, I did not know what I wanted to do after the MBA. Um, and actually, if I'm honest, six months in, I'm still exploring it. Not because um, it hasn't become clear to me, but because it's opened up so many opportunities and new ways of looking at things and understanding myself about what's important. Um, but I'm now starting to understand what I really want to be doing in my career. Uh, and, and to your question about um, what I was looking for, I knew that coming here and, and doing this would be something that would be very challenging. I knew it would be something that would be very good for my own development as a leader. And that's something that Cranfield really focused on. And that was important to me in the application process is finding the right environment for me to be in. And, and this has served me very well. What I would say for anybody, I know you mentioned this earlier, Lauren, is try and, and get to know the, the location and the people that are there. Um, and if you want to reach out to the people who've supported you for this call, whether it's Dean, Joe, myself or others, we'd be happy to talk to you. And as we are now, be very open and honest about the experience, because if you're in the environment for you to grow, you can achieve some great things. And that's the one thing you should focus on. Dan, you've got to stick around because you should be teaching on the MBA. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, Joseph that same question. Joseph, what does transformation mean to you? Uh, well, uh, before I came to the MBA, I knew that uh, there were some points which I wanted to improve, especially around people skills and uh, uh, communication. Uh, so uh, I wanted to understand uh, how to lead people. And uh, that was bang on in the first term itself. So we had our leadership module in the first term, and uh, it taught us the very basic fundamental things about uh, uh, people, basically, uh, why people do some things. And, uh, and it also helped me understand myself. Uh, so even the small cohort size also allows us to have a deep, meaningful relationship with our peers. and. Uh, we get uh, constructive feedback on uh, anything uh, which helps us uh, really improve upon that uh, part. So uh, all of these experience included, uh, I can say that uh, I'm uh, a very a, a better in terms of confidence and people skills and uh, uh, teamwork ability. Yeah. Joseph, thank you. You're a great example uh, of growth whilst you're here. Thank you. Please stick around. Uh, I got a question, Lauren, for you, actually. Uh, we didn't, you had a, one of the words at the beginning of our slides, which had leadership. Can you say, before we finish, a tiny little bit about the leadership focus that we have at Cranford? Yes, the, the fifth of my five keywords we ran out of time for. So absolutely, as, as Joseph mentioned, the leadership module. So leadership focus is, at, is embedded in every aspect of the MBA. So we don't just have one leadership module, leadership runs throughout the course. We have executive coaching that continues to, to run throughout the course. And I think ultimately that's the reason that we have the academics we do, that we have the faculty we do, because people are giving up time away from um, families and, and work to make space to teach on the MBA because they want to create the leaders of the future and that's that's what our mission is about and that is what we're passionate about providing to people and I think this is where maybe that transformation message comes full circle because actually we have we've already seen how the the network plays a part in that transformation the quality of the faculty plays a part in the transformation it's also the leadership focus throughout that runs as part of this a part of the course so Transformation is part of all of this. And I think you asked me right at the beginning, lots of people use transformation. What does it actually mean? And I think the reason Cranfield owns the right to call itself the Transformation MBA is because it is pinning together the immersive environment. It's bringing together the quality of the faculty, the quality of the experience to change the way you see the world. And it's, it is transformative because of this. You heard it here first. I've said that more than once already. <laughs> it's really quite a program that you're on. This is not the last chance that you have. We have a Dean's webinar coming up uh, on the 6th of April. 
at 10 a.m. British summer time. Um, please do your best to block that out into your diaries. You'll see the details on the screen now. 6th of April, 10 a.m. British summer time. We're GMT plus one right now. So put that in your diaries. You get a chance then to have conversations with the dean, the head, not dean, the dean that's joined our, our session today. Although, dean, it's great to have you with us. Uh, this is the Dean David, Professor David Oglethorpe, who heads up the whole of the School of Management. So please put that in your diary. We have run out of time. I can't believe it's, it's gone so quickly. I'm going to do a quick round of thanks. Uh, Steffi and Martin in particular, I really want to thank you for joining us uh, today and giving us a flavor, uh, a taste, uh, a tone. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a millionaire poet on your right there. So uh, I'm a fan already. Love that. So thank you again. Look at that. <laughs> I love how you interact together. That was great to see as well. And also to Stephen, to Joseph, to Daniel, and to Dean. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy days, Stephen, especially because you're out there in the real world. Thank you again. Thank you for joining. Uh, it's been a fantastic session. Please keep talking to us. Studio management today was by Robin Hackett. Executive producers were David Metcalf and Ellie. Uh, my name is Toby Thompson. Thank you for watching.